One is you can't do reunification if there is no way for that child to have access to the alienating parent. Reunification does not happen in a vacuum. When courts order and say, well, let's cut off all access and we'll just wait until the child is ready, that does not happen, okay? Children, especially if they're victims of alienation, are not going to spontaneously go to the alienating parent and say, gee, I want to now have a relationship with the other parent. That does not happen for a couple of reasons. One is children live by a very simple principle. When uncomfortable, avoid. <laughs> they will lie, sneak, and cheat to avoid discomfort. Not necessarily maliciously, just to find that comfort level. If they have to subject themselves to the discomfort of fighting and arguing with an alienating parent, they're just not going to do that, okay? So, um, but our, uh, and the other thing that I think is helpful when parents are trying to work for reunification, and I think one of the questions deals with supervised uh, visits or visitation centers. A lot of times parents ask me, what do I do in a certain situation? How do I know I'm doing the right thing? Typically, the answer is whatever it is that's going to reduce the child's anxiety. That's the direction you want to move into, reducing the child's anxiety. If you initiate and create anxiety, you're working against yourself, okay? That's why, for an example, if there's been prolonged um, time when, when there has been no relationship or communication, the worst thing that the parent can do is to try to educate the kid about alienation and what a, uh, uh, how bad the other parent is and trying to convince the child that they should see their point of view as to what had happened. You'll lose the child. I mean, they, they don't want to hear it. And most children that have been severely alienated, when I've talked to them, they either have a very different interpretation of what all is happening or they don't want to talk about it. And it doesn't help to push the issue. So, yeah, there's another there's another related issue here that's so um, often forgotten, because the tendency is to focus solely on the interest of the children, and it it is it's certainly been my experience, and I know the experience of all of the other uh, experts that you're going to hear from today and tomorrow. That the the person who has been estranged. And especially if it's taken um, the victim parent, if it, especially if it's existed over a number of years, that person too is substantially changed by the experience. And they are almost always very negatively changed. Mm -hmm. um, it's not uncommon, for example, for them to actually fear um, reconnection because sometimes the consequences of the alienation has been so profound that they, they, they no longer feel connected to the children. They feel uh, so remote and disconnected and alien that, and they've been rejected so often, they are actually afraid of the process of reconnection, much as they want it. And They're so awful they, afraid of being a parent in terms of like, you know, how to correct and discipline the child yep. and the fear that, you know, that's going to be used against them later. Because it has been so many times before, right. for example. Yeah. Um, all right, the next question is, um, what would be the most practical ground rule for, unif for reunification using supervised visitation? Okay, um, first of all, we have to be concerned about who's doing the supervision. And one of the concerns that I have, I, I think supervised visits and even visitation centers are overly used. And I actually was one of the founders of our local uh, visitation center. And on the surface, it makes a lot of sense. But here's the concern that I have. I think visitation and supervision makes sense when there has been a belief that somehow there is a threat to the children's safety, psychologically or physically, okay? Because the very nature of supervision is alienating in the sense that it reinforces in the child's mind that this parent is somehow a risk to their safety. So it can actually reinforce. The other problem that I have, especially with supervi uh, 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 visitation centers, 
is if you look at the way most of them work, they have very strict rules, and very often the visitation is in a room, and they may not like be able to hug or touch. Um, and again, I think that's something the children should control, not the parent. But anyway, they're stuck in a room for an hour, and maybe there's a few games and a few things, and they say, in effect, you know, entertain each other so all of you can walk away and have this wonderful experience. How many of you have ever sat in a room by yourself with your child for one hour <laughs> and say, gee, this was a wonderful experience? I think in a lot of ways it's, it's unrealistic. One of the ways of reducing anxiety and fear for children, as well as for adults, is physical activity. They should be encouraged to get involved in physical activity. Going out playing a ball, going out and uh, running, or you know, especially with the younger ones, going to the jungle gym. Those kind of behaviors inhibit anxiety. Give you a little secret. If you're ever depressed, okay? Anybody here never been depressed? Does someone want to hand out cards? <laughs> okay? When you're depressed, do a bunch of physical exercise. While you're doing the exercise, you're not going to feel depressed. Okay, now you may afterwards, but it will give you relief, okay? And our doctor friends could probably explain the physiology behind that. But it's also true in terms of reestablishing a relationship. The other problem I have with visitation centers and even supervised visits is often with the court order, there is no criteria as to who has the authority to reduce the supervision, under what conditions, and when should it happen. Okay, so you're kind of in a legal limbo that becomes very frustrating and confusing for everybody else. There, there needs to be a mechanism, and it and it's, can't always just be based on time because you could say, well, you're going to do supervised visits for the next five months. Well, for the next five months, assuming what? What is supposed to happen in that five months that says to you, you could reduce or eliminate the supervision? I rarely, I, I don't know if I've even seen court orders even define that. They just say supervised visit, and then theoretically, if they want to modify it, they got to go back to the court. They got tons of money. Um, this is a good task for parent coordinators to be involved in the process because they can perhaps make those judgments. If the court gives them arbitration power to modify the parenting time or the supervision, but again, that should be in a court order too. Okay. Yeah. The other thing about parental coordination is that one has to be cautious about which role you're engaging in when you are a parental coordinator and contemplating facilitating the unification process. Um, I think it's, I think what was being said uh, by Doug is absolutely the case that you're so much better off if what you can try and do is create a framework of, instead of calling it supervision, basically therapeutic realignment where you're, you're actually, in, where, you, where the person who's going to actually be involved in the, quote, supervision, meets with the child beforehand, creates somewhat of a relationship, gives the child some expectations of what's going to happen, and of course does it in a, in a, a much better environment than a, a box, um, and, and then proceeds to work with play or whatever strategies are being used to try and accomplish the mission. One of my favorite things to do, quite honestly, when I do this work is my office is about three quarters of a mile away from Fort Lauderdale Beach. And I arrange to take both of them down to the beach yeah. and go for a long walk along the beach. And then I fade out to the extent that I feel like it's appropriate. Yeah. And art therapy could be part of the conduit to do that. I mean, you could have a parent-child doing collages and things like that. You know, and, and kids and, and adults can uh, enjoy that kind of thing. So it's a conduit. 